Welcome to ADP Training, YouTube's automotive technology channel. In this channel, you'll learn all kinds of auto repair secrets, how your automobile works, and how to diagnose it. electric valves make possible fine electronic control over the fuel injection time quantity and the higher pressure that the common rail technology makes available providing better fuel atomization in order to lower engine noise the engine's electronic control unit can inject a small amount of diesel just before the main injection event this is called pilot injection thus reducing vibration as well as optimizing injection timing and quantity for variations in fuel quality and cold starting. Some advanced common rail fuel systems perform as many as 10 injections per stroke. Common rail engines require very short or no heating up time at all. They produce lower engine noise and emissions than older systems. Older diesel engine systems were limited by several factors. They were cam driven and injection pressure was proportional to engine speed. This typically meant that the highest injection pressure could only be achieved at the highest engine speed and the maximum achievable injection pressure decreased as engine speed decreased. The injection pressure is tied to the instantaneous pressure of a single injection event, making these systems more troublesome. They were limited in the number and timing of injection events that could be commanded during a single combustion event. For the typical distributor and lean system, the start of injection occurred at a predetermined pressure, also called pop pressure, and also ended at a predetermined pressure. This characteristic of dummy injectors in the cylinder head operated to open and closed at pressures determined by the spring preload to the pintle in the fuel injector valve. Once the pressure in the injector reached a predetermined level, the pintle would lift and injection would start. In common rail systems, a high pressure pump stores a reservoir of fuel at high pressure of up to and above 29,000 psi. The term common rail refers to the fact that all of the fuel injectors are supplied by a common fuel rail, which is a pressure accumulator, where the fuel is stored at very high pressures. This accumulator supplies multiple fuel injectors with high pressure fuel. This simplifies the purpose of the high pressure pump in that it only has to maintain a specific pressure at a target, either mechanically or electronically controlled. The fuel injectors are typically ECU or computer controlled. When the fuel injectors are electrically activated, a piezoelectric injector is opened and fuel is sprayed into the cylinders at the desired pressure. Since the fuel pressure energy is stored remotely and the injectors are electrically actuated, the injection pressure at the start and end of injection is the same pressure in the accumulator thus producing a square injection pattern. In other words, the injection pressure and rate will be the same for each of the multiple injection events. common rail systems, a high pressure pump stores a reservoir of fuel at high pressure of up to and above 29,000 psi. The term common rail refers to the fact that all of the fuel injectors are supplied by a common fuel rail, which is a pressure accumulator, where the fuel is stored at very high pressure. Diesel fuel is drawn from the fuel tank by a low pressure transfer pump. This may be an electric pump located in the fuel tank or mechanical pump which forms part of the main high pressure pump. 
On its journey to the high pressure pump, the fuel will pass through at least one fuel filter assembly. Fuel at a constant transfer pressure is then passed to the intake of the mechanical high pressure pump, which acts to increase fuel pressure to around 29,000 psi during cranking and around 23,000 psi operating pressure while the engine is running. Newer systems are capable of operation at higher fuel pressures. The pressure at the high pressure pump is regulated by controlling the quantity of fuel entering the pumping elements within the high pressure pump, or by control of the amount of pressurized fuel returning from the fuel rail to the tank. Lubrication of the pump is provided by fuel circulation. The highly pressurized fuel is pumped to the common rail. The fuel accumulated in the common rail is delivered to each engine cylinder by an electronically controlled fuel piezoelectric injector. A fuel rail pressure sensor is used to provide the fuel pressure feedback signal to the engine controller. Each injector is electronically controlled allowing precise operation to deliver the required amount of fuel at the correct time. Common rail diesel fuel systems with electromagnetic solenoid valve type injectors allow a degree of fuel to return to the tank by internal leakage through the injector body, referred to as injector back leakage. Excessive back leakage of fuel at the fuel injectors due to wear can cause a drop in common rail fuel pressure and in some circumstances may prevent the vehicle engine from being started. Fuel pressure is electronically controlled by the fuel rail pressure regulator. The fuel rail pressure sensor is a duty cycle solenoid mounted in the pump or in the fuel rail itself and controlled by the electronic control module based on feedback from an electronic pressure sensor in the fuel rail that provides fuel to the piezoelectric injectors. The fuel rail pressure regulator duty cycle operates in a 5 to 95% duty cycle window and unplugging the solenoid either drives the fuel pressure to the maximum level or vice versa. These sensors behave electronically in two opposite ways. Here is one type of output. You could also have the complete inverse but the operation is the same. The electronic control module increases pulse width to lower pressure, so if the solenoid receives a 100% duty cycle for some reason, pressure will be at its lowest, and performance will obviously degrade. A 5% duty cycle will produce a fuel pressure of 23,200 psi, and a 95% duty cycle feed will produce a 5,000 psi reading. The pressure should never go below 3,000 psi. If it does, something is wrong. Beware. Use common sense safety practices when servicing any diesel system. While maximum control pressure can reach nearly 4,000 psi, the piezoelectric diesel fuel system is pressure relieved at a blistering 27,550 psi. Cracking a fuel line loose on a running diesel engine could easily be fatal. Don't go there. And don't fool with the diesel fuel rail bleeder valve unless the engine is at rest and the pressure has been relieved. form above shows a test of the fuel system on a common rail diesel engine of the fuel rail pressure sensor. In this system, the ACM varies the rail pressure between 4000 at idle 
to 23,000 PSI at full speed and load. The sensor is the feedback component in a control loop and informs the ECM the pressure in the rail. The ECM can then tell the pump to increase or decrease output accordingly. The ECM controls the pressure limiter to control pump pressure. When you press the pedal, the ECM will immediately calculate how much fuel to give the engine based on speed, load, and the internal calibration table. This fueling table is specifically for that engine vehicle combination. The sensor gives a continual feedback of rail pressure, and the ECM then makes any pressure adjustments almost instantaneously. We can analyze the performance of the system by graphing the output of the sensor against time while we start, run, accelerate, hold at full throttle, and return to idle. We finally switch off and wait for ACM power down normally around 10 seconds after key off. The oscilloscope is best set to a slow time base. The waveform starts on the left just after key on, where the voltage is 0.5 volts, corresponding to a pressure of 0 psi. This is to provide a function check. It should never read 0 volts, so if it does, the fuel pressure sensor has failed. Then, we start the engine. The voltage rises to about 1.3 volts, which corresponds to about 4000 psi, a common value at idle. We then do a wide open throttle, and the ECM immediately adds a shot of fuel to accelerate the engine. The voltage then settles back to a lower value, about 2.5 volts, until we release the pedal back to idle, when it settles back to 1.3 volts, as when idling. We then turn the key off and the engine stops. Note how the signal drops slowly back to 0.5 volts over about 10 seconds before the ECM powers down near the right hand end of the waveform. If the voltage drops very quickly to 0.5 volts, then the residual pressure is leaking away too quickly and may indicate a problem with the system as a leaky injector or a leak back through the pump. Remember, this test is done on an unloaded engine. On a fully loaded engine, the center section of the graph will rise well above 2.5 volts. It won't go above 4.5 volts, as this represents about 23,000 psi. Again, this is a function check on the sensor. If it goes to 5 volts or the sensor reference voltage, there is a fault with the sensor. <laughs>
This enabled the development of an electronic computer-controlled injection system for diesel engines. Bosch and other injector manufacturers designed a very high-pressure, common rail, direct injection system that used piezo injectors. The engineers discovered they could quiet the idle, improve fuel economy, and reduce emissions if the injector made multiple small injections during a 3 to 5 millisecond injection cycle. An electric coil cannot respond that rapidly, but piezoelectric devices can and many of the most modern injection systems deliver up to 10 separate injection events in that 3 to 5 millisecond interval. This is fast state-of-the-art technology. Pressure is regulated and monitored by the electronic diesel control unit, which receives an electronic input from the pressure sensor. The sensor operates on 5 volts and provides a 0.5 to 4.5 volts linear amplified analog output proportional to pressure. The highly accurate and ruggedly designed sensor uses a thin film sense element which provides highly reliable and repeatable measurements. To test the pressure sensor electrical points, you need to prove the reference voltage coming from the ECM, the signal line, and sensor ground. First, disconnect the diesel injection pressure sensor. Turn the ignition switch on. Then using a multimeter probe on the sensor reference voltage, usually the red wire, and verify 5 volts. If not, then the ECM or wiring is at fault. Then, probe at the sensor ground, between battery positive and sensor ground, and using the multimeter. You should see battery voltage. This points to a good sensor ground. Last, reconnect the diesel injection pressure sensor, then probe at the signal wire. You should see about half a volt with key on, if not, then disconnect the sensor and the ECM connector. Using a test light connected to battery power, touch at the sensor connector's signal wire. On the meter, you should see battery voltage momentarily coming from the test light. This will prove out the signal wire. The diesel injection pressure sensor is a standard 5 volt reference component. Just prove your reference ground and signal lines. On diesel engines, a turbocharger pressurizes the intake manifold with up to 2.5 times more air and the engine's natural displacement. Traditional high-flow turbochargers generate their maximum boost pressure at high engine speed and load conditions. Overboost is prevented with an exhaust bypass or wastegate that limits the exhaust gas energy reaching the turbine. However, during partial load operation, these large turbochargers apply far less boost, and boost control is extremely limited. The newest diesel engines are equipped with exhaust gas recirculation or EGR to control oxides of nitrogen or NOx. To make exhaust gas flow into the intake manifold, exhaust pressure must be higher than intake manifold pressure. So in a turbo diesel, boost must be controlled during partial load operation. 
engine makers have opted for all-speed boost control using small, highly efficient quick-response turbo chargers that generate boost just above idle RPM. To control boost at low speed, they utilize a variable geometry turbine, or VGT. The VGT has a set of movable vanes in the turbine housing, and they control boost by controlling exhaust turbine inlet pressure. At low engine speeds when exhaust flow is low, the vanes are partially closed. This increases the pressure of the exhaust pushing up against the turbine blades, making the turbine spin faster and generating more boost. Advanced materials and precision engineering are needed to keep these moving parts operating smoothly in the hottest part of the turbocharger. There are two different basic designs. The most common design rotates the vanes, like slats in a window blind, to open and close the flow area. The vanes are mounted in the turbine housing so they can pivot about one end. A plate with pins, seen here in yellow, positioned into the center as each vein is rotated, causing the vanes to rotate together about their pivot points. Variable geometry turbo chargers were originally developed for automotive gasoline engines in cars about 20 years ago. We can expect to see them on many light and medium duty truck engines and a surprising number of passenger car diesels over the next few decades. Seen here, in this lower view, is a variable geometry turbo charger pivot mechanism. Engine makers have opted for all speed boost control using small, highly efficient, quick response turbo chargers that generate boost just above idle RPM. To control boost at low speed, they utilize a variable geometry turbine, or VGT, whereby the exhaust pressure is regulated. The VGT has a set of movable vanes or fins in the turbine housing, seen here in black with a red back plate. They control boost by controlling exhaust turbine inlet pressure. At low engine speeds when exhaust flow is low, the vanes are partially closed. This increases the pressure of the exhaust pushing up against the turbine blades, making the turbine spin faster and generating more boost. In a way, this design creates a sort of bypass, so that the exhaust pressure reaching the turbine blades can be controlled. By altering the geometry of the turbine housing, meaning pivoting the blades as the engine accelerates, the turbo's aspect ratio can be maintained at its optimum. Because of this, VGTs have a minimal amount of lag, have a low boost threshold, and are very efficient at higher engine speeds. Again, the design rotates the vanes, like slats in a window blind, to open and close the flow area. The vanes are mounted in the turbine housing so they can pivot about one end. A plate with pins, seen here in yellow, positioned into the center as each vane is rotated, causing the vanes to rotate together about their pivot points. VGTs do not require a wastegate. Often the vanes are controlled by a membrane actuator identical to that of a wastegate. However, increasingly electric servo actuation is used and controlled by the ECM. <laughs> Thank you.
This exploded view shows the construction of the variable geometry turbo charger. Variable geometry turbo chargers or VGT are a family of turbo chargers usually designed to allow the effective aspect ratio, called the AR ratio, of the turbo to be altered as conditions change. The actuator plate, seen in yellow, is attached to the movable blades or fins at a pivot point. The red back plate keeps everything together and prevents the pieces from falling. The yellow back plate turns a certain amount of degrees to actuate the movable blades. All this is tied to the vacuum actuator by a connecting rod. The actuator itself can be controlled by vacuum or a servo stepper motor may be employed. Either way, the actuator is computer or ECM controlled according to the desired boost pressure. Variable geometry turbo chargers or VGT are a family of turbo chargers usually designed to allow the effective aspect ratio, called the AR ratio, of the turbo to be altered as conditions change. Traditional high flow turbo chargers generate their maximum boost pressure at high engine speed and load conditions. Over boost is prevented with an exhaust bypass or waste gate that limits the exhaust gas energy reaching the turbine. However, during partial load operation, these large turbo chargers apply far less boost, and boost control is extremely limited. Geometry turbo chargers or VGT are a family of turbo chargers usually designed to allow the effective aspect ratio, sometimes called AR ratio, of the turbo to be altered as conditions change. This is done because optimum aspect ratio at low engine speeds is very different from that at high engine speeds. If the aspect ratio is too large, the turbo will fail to create boost at low speeds. If the aspect ratio is too small, the turbo will choke the engine at high speeds, leading to high exhaust manifold pressures, high pumping losses, and ultimately lower power output. By altering the geometry of the turbine housing as the engine accelerates, the turbo's aspect ratio can be maintained at its optimum. The cause of this VGTs have a minimal amount of lag, have a low boost threshold, and are very efficient at higher engine speeds. VGTs do not require a waste gate. Often the vanes are controlled by a membrane actuator, identical to that of a waste gate. However, increasingly electric servo actuation is used, and controlled by the ECM. Hydraulic actuators have also been used in some applications. Failures associated with the variable geometry turbo chargers are related to damage to the ring plate, the blades, or vanes, and the connecting rod mechanism. It is somewhat common to pull the turbo apart and clean up rust and soot that causes the vane system to bind and cause drivability problems. Turbo chargers can be damaged by dirty or corroded oil, and most makers recommend more frequent oil changes for turbocharged engines. 
many owners and some companies recommend using synthetic coils with a higher fluidity when cold and do not break down as quickly as conventional oils. Because turbos heat up when running, it is recommended to let the engine idle for up to 3 minutes before shutting it off if the turbo charger was used shortly before stopping. This gives the oil and the lower exhaust temperatures time to cool the turbo rotating assembly and ensures that oil is applied to the turbo charger while the turbine housing and exhaust manifold are still very hot. Otherwise coking of the lubricating oil trapped in the unit may occur when the heat soaks into the bearings. This causes rapid bearing wear and failure when the car is restarted. Even small particles of burnt oil will accumulate and lead to choking the oil supply and to failure. This problem is less pronounced in diesel engines due to higher quantities of oil in the crankcase. A turbo timer can keep an engine running for a pre-specified period of time. This automatically provides a cool down period. Oil coking is also eliminated by foil bearings. A more complex and problematic protective barrier against oil coking is the use of water cool bearing cartridges. The water boils in the cartridge when the engine is shut off and forms a natural recirculation to drain away the heat. Nevertheless, it is not a good idea to shut the engine off while the turbo and manifold are still red hot. In custom racing applications, utilizing tubular headers rather than cast iron manifolds, the need for a cool down period is reduced because the lighter headers store much less heat than heavy cast iron manifolds. Newer ceramic manifolds take care of this issue most efficiently. Perform cleaning as follows. Use protection when cleaning carbon and rust from the turbo charger. With a circular disc, clean the surfaces of the housing, including the center, where the unison ring is centered. Cleaning the outer edges will allow for easy assembly. Clean the unison ring, including the inner and outer ring edges. Then, Using the emery cloth and scuff pads, clean the recess cam area, cam, and the pin. Be careful to not heavily gouge or remove metal. The emery cloth and scuff pads are also good for cleaning the posts that the veins attached to, as well as getting into any hard-to-clean corners. As the cleaning pads wear, they will create a nice smooth surface. Change over to the finer cleaning disc and clean the surface of the turbine housing as shown. As for the veins, we recommend using the scuff pad and parts cleaner as available. Clean all parts with solvent and dry with compressed air. Reinstall all of the veins and adjust them evenly. It is easier to leave them open and close them to align with the unison ring as it is placed over them. This is where marking the position of the actuator cam on the turbine housing will prove to be helpful when installing the unison ring. Follow these assembly instructions. It is recommended that a very light coat of anti-seize lubricant be applied to the turbine housing and the inner surface of the unison ring. This is to coat and protect the metal from rusting and not to lubricate the unison ring and veins. At this time you need to verify the movement of the unison ring and veins. Observe the free movement of the veins and the change in the opening between them. Verify that the actuator cam also moves freely. Once satisfied with the restored free movement, continue to finish the assembly. Leaving the turbine housing on the bench, lower the turbo charger over the unison ring 
paying attention to the alignment of both the housing and the camp pin. Reinstall the bolts clamp torquing the nut to 160 inch pounds, then loosening and retorquing to 150 inch pound. Reinstall the turbo assembly as per the shop manual using a new oil inlet gasket and drain tube bolt rings. <laughs> Conditioning and cleaning the variable geometry or boat charger is a mainstay repair in today's diesel repair industry. Disassembly as follows. Begin by placing the turbo on a bench with the turbine side facing up. It is recommended to cover or plug the compressor housing openings and the oil conduits to protect them from metal burrs. Using an ink marker. Mark the orientation of the V-clamp and remove the clamp. Next, mark the turbine housing to help line up the housing during assembly. Turn the turbo charger over, then lift the main assembly off of the housing. Gently tap the housing with a mallet. It is recommended that you mark the location of the slot in the unison ring that mates with the actuator cam for easier assembly. Perform the inspection as follows. Once separated, it is time for an inspection. What you see here is typical of a stuck variable geometry or boat charger. Rust and carbon can build up around the center of the housing where the unison ring is centered. With this particular turbo charger, some of the veins were completely stuck and required force to break them free. Seen here is an example of excessive rust and pitting. If the turbo charger has some pitting, proceed to the cleaning procedure and inspect for excessive pitting afterwards. Otherwise, replace the turbo charger. Replacement will also be necessary if there is excessive wear of the unison ring or the cam pin. <laughs> Electric actuation refers to the electrical control and actuation of a turbo's variable geometry mechanism. Compared to pneumatic actuation, it provides a more direct link between input signal and actual movement to control the boost. As a result, VGT electric actuation of the vanes provides more accurate control over a wider range of operating conditions. The electro servo actuation has several sensors and motorized components that work in tandem to control the turbo boost. The electrical servo actuator is often either water or oil cooled. It consists of an electric motor and gears to regulate the vane position. A position and speed sensor are also employed. On some applications, a worm type gear is used to actuate the vanes. With the engine operating at part throttle, such as during highway crews, the electric actuator can reduce the exhaust back pressure, improving fuel consumption. At engine cold start, when catalyst light off is a critical aspect, electric actuation can shorten the time required to bring the catalyst up to operating temperature and maximizing direct exhaust flow to the catalyst. Other benefits include tailored performance levels, better traction control, and of course further improvement in fuel economy. 
See our other video on the detailed operation of the electronically controlled variable geometry per boat charger. The common rail injection diesel computer or ECM uses a dual current triggering scheme to actuate the injectors. As a general rule the ECM can trigger the piezo electric crystal stack at minus 20 to plus 20 amps and at nominal voltage of 200 volts. These figures can change depending on the actual engine control design. The ECM triggers the piezo injector using a push-pull electronic circuit. Represented here using actual transistors, the push-pull circuit works by changing the polarity of the trigger voltage. If a certain section of the push-pull transistor circuit is operating, then current flows in one direction. If the other section of the push-pull circuit is doing the switching, then current flows in a different direction. Some piezo injection systems thrive for partial pindle lifts, which is impossible in regular gasoline coil type injectors. By controlling the amount of current, or amps, that flow in one direction, the ACM can then regulate injection in a wide range of situations. Remember, all this happens at a rate of 3 to 10 times every 5 milliseconds. The speed of the system and the amount of currents calls for a state-of-the-art engine control module, which is also why these units are quite expensive. The stack of piezoelectric elements is quite different than a coil. The length of the stack changes slightly if a voltage of about 400 volt is put across the ends, the response being extremely rapid. The effective inertia of the stack is very much lower than a metal, such as iron or steel. There are no moving parts, just the length of the stack changing. The stack itself does not oscillate in and out like a solenoid pintle. In other words, there is no clicking noise. The speed of the injector pulse means that the fuel injection may be controlled by the drive module to limits far more precise than solenoid actuation. Up to 10 separate injections per power stroke event is possible. Piezo injectors play a key part in developing modern engine combustion processes in the automotive industry. Permitting high precision injection, they are also capable of operating at very high pressures. On top of this, piezo injectors are far lighter and as said before, respond more quickly than conventional solenoid injectors. Their greatest edge lies in them being able to realize partial needle lifts, something the technology behind solenoid valves is incapable of doing. This provides the basis for continuously shaping the rate of injection. Again, piezo injectors work on a voltages of up to 400 volts and currents ranging from minus 20 to plus 20 amps. Adjustments beyond these levels can be made by the manufacturer.
electro servo actuator has several sensors and motorized components that work in tandem to control the turbo boost. The electrical servo actuator is often either water or oil cooled. It consists of an electric motor and gears to regulate the vane position. A position and speed sensor are also employed. To test the variable geometry turbo charger position sensor, do as follows. The position sensor is a three wire style sensor with a reference voltage, ground, and a signal line going to the ECM. The ECM provides the reference voltage and the sensor ground. The signal wire then provides a return for the actual position of the turbo actuator. First, let's prove the reference voltage by taking a voltage reading between battery ground and the 5 volt reference line. 5 or close to 5 volts should be present. It rarely reads 5 volts as there are voltage losses across the wires. Second, prove the sensor ground line. This is a ground line provided specifically for this circuit. Instead of using a voltmeter, use a test light between battery power and the sensor ground. The test light draws about 300 milliamps, proving the ground line's viability. Finally, to test the signal line involves two steps. Testing the wire itself and the sensor's response. To test the wire, disconnect the connector at the ECM. Then, short the signal wire to ground. With the test light, probe between battery power and the grounded wire. You should see a bright light. The 300 milliamps drawn by the test light also proves that there are no high resistance spots present in the circuit. Then, measure the voltage response by manually moving the actuator and measuring the voltage. This may be hard to manage due to the difficulty in manually moving the VGT actuator. and diesel variable geometry turbo chargers or VGT based systems do not employ a VGT actuator feedback position sensor. Here's how these systems operate. The system is equipped with an oil pressure actuated variable vane turbo charger. The variable geometry turbo or VGT has no position sensors. So turbo and wastegate position is determined using a duty cycle to position transfer function. To verify actual position based on the nominal transfer function, an intrusive monitor sweep is performed. When monitor entry conditions are met, the intrusive monitor for VGT fixes the EGR valve to a specific position, closes the waste gate, if any, and then commands an inferred turbo position of 25%. Then, 85% is commanded within a calibratable time. The minimum and maximum map values are saved and compared to a threshold. If the desired separation in map pressure isn't achieved, a fault is detected. If the desired separation in map is achieved prior to the full 10 seconds allotted, the test is aborted and considered a pass. In the example above, at 383 seconds, the GR valve is set to 10%. One second later, the turbocharger is commanded to 25%. The 25% position is held for 5 seconds to allow map to stabilize. After 5 seconds, turbocharger is ramped back to 85%. Since the pressure rise in MAP was greater than 4.5 kPa, this test was a pass. This monitor also serves to monitor for a slower responding boost pressure system. 
due to the time component of the threshold. This channel is for do-it-yourselfers, as well as professional auto repair technicians. We present all the content using the latest CG animation techniques, on-hands video, and how-to, tips and techniques. We encourage you to subscribe to this channel now. Once subscribed, anytime we upload a new automotive tip, secret, or technology video, you will be notified. Finally, by subscribing, you will also be part of our weekly freebies. Yes, we're constantly giving away lots of free merchandise. Automotive Diagnostics and Publishing's Mandy Concepcion, the owner of this channel, is one of the most prolific auto technology authors on the web. At any moment in time, we may offer a free book, Kindle eBook, Android app, one of our own diagnostic equipment, or even auto repair software that runs on your PC. Subscribe now free of charge, learn lots of automotive technology secrets, and win free stuff. It doesn't get any better than that. Thanks for watching, and enjoy.